our mind is such a system whatever we feed it will keep on repeating the same thing again and again it's up to us what to feed fear is nothing but your imagination getting activated inside your mind we have to believe that we are bigger than our failures bigger than our fears you are not what you think you are hmm. you are something much bigger than uh, who you think you are when i ask somebody to uh, think about themselves and they tell me that you know i am really scared to take the major transition i tell them whatever you have all these things in mind they at this point of time everything whatever you think about future is just an imagination because it has not happened yet so this is what inner dialogue does to us what you tell yourself is very very important than what actually happens to you right so keep mm-hmm. your inner dialogue in a positive way life when it goes through you you just observe and things would happen so universe works in different ways we just have to believe that it happens Good evening ladies and gentlemen welcome to another episode of the life positive show tonight we have a very special guest with us he is mr santosh joshi santosh joshi is a past life regression therapist a life transformation coach a motivation speaker and a best selling author founder of a 12 minute new age healing technique called sky healing santosh has helped many people obtain a stress free life Uh, he is the author of three books keys the secret to a happy and regret free life many lives one soul and sky is not the limit all three became national best sellers and are set to make their mark internationally through his program skies and beyond santosh joshi offers life coaching to executives and professionals helping them transform and take a quantum leap in their personal and professional lives Santosh uh, also conducts work workshops and personal sessions on past life regression. So welcome Santosh ji to the Life Positive show. It's a great honor and pleasure to have you on the show tonight. Thank you. Uh, Thank you Shivi. Thank you for inviting me. Mm-hmm. And it's wonderful to be on this uh, platform. You're welcome Santosh ji. So let's begin with the first question. So you have been a variety of things for a, for many years which includes helping people. as you just uh, recently mentioned that there was somebody who was speaking to one who was like sharing all his life issues with you so tell me what's the most common problem that people come to you uh, see uh, problems uh, people tell various kinds of problems but uh, mm-hmm. the root is common you know so there could be various symptoms to a similar situation similar thing mm-hmm. uh, so some people come to me because they are too stressed out some people come to me because they are uh, you know they are scared of uh, you know various things including failure and something going wrong in their life some people come to me uh, because they have some relationship issues because of you know their own uh, habits or things uh, various things you know there there are people who are either coming with fears or insecurities or stresses or uh, a number of things but uh, i think the root goes to the one one simple thing and i that's what i uh, tell uh, them about uh, what they are doing is uh, i tell them they are manifesting their own beliefs mm-hmm. most often they you know when we discuss uh, they tell me that yes this is what they have been thinking about uh, whatever they uh, are scared about they are fearful about uh, our mind is you know in, is is uh, such a system uh, whatever we feed it will keep on repeating the same thing again and again it's up to us what to feed uh, to that uh, system and whatever uh, you know it keeps on repeating that becomes a stronger and stronger and stronger belief so more the number of similar thoughts stronger is the uh, uh, the, the belief we form and uh, uh, so you know whatever is, whatever they see themselves as now uh their own perception about themselves their own uh, you know what what they think they are is nothing but just a facade they are uh, identifying themselves as or themselves to the facade they have created around themselves uh that is made of uh, people's opinions about themselves people's expectations uh from them uh their own experiences and failures 
and uh, of course you know conditioning they have gone through and what they want to project themselves as to the world around to the people around and this facade uh, you know it's like a wall uh, becomes thicker and thicker and thicker as time goes because we uh, you know keep on adding up to uh, you know our own experiences and you know things we have gone through but also to what we want to show others as mm. okay thicker the wall the farther you are from your own true self farther you are from your own uh, you know purpose potential wisdom you know this ppw model uh, mm. which we all come with and uh, that is why whole lot of issues start taking place in their life because uh, they want to project themselves as something else which they are not uh, this projection is based on people's opinions and expectations expectations from them which is probably away from what they expect from themselves their own dreams which they want to achieve mm. uh, and uh, added to that their own experiences including their fears and uh, you know uh, their emotional traumas and turmoil and so so the problems people come to me could be varied mm. but ultimately it boils down to one particular thing that they uh, somewhere uh during the time of their whole lifetime have gone away from their own idea or their own true self the, their own idea of self and what they think they are has become two different personalities and mm. this wall thicker the wall is the more uh, misery you go through in your own life so how do you help them break these walls which they have created for themselves and which have disassociated and disconnected them with their own true self their actual dreams desires and aspirations so basically uh, the idea is that uh, there are several ways of doing it i mean uh, you know first of course we have to disidentify ourselves with that mm-hmm. you know disidentification mm-hmm. uh, it's it's a uh, sometimes it's a very big thing because you have you have so such strong identification uh, with that wall a uh, a small example you know uh, when we are small we want to do something in life you know ask a small little baby little child 3 4 year 5 year old child what do you want to do in life and the uh, child would most probably tell about, uh, about uh, his or her own purpose of life you know so a child has uh, is coming with a purpose that uh, he or she is going to spread wisdom which they have seen uh, only teachers doing so uh, the child would say i want to become a teacher so what happens is you know suddenly the societal conditioning that's where it starts so people around including the parents will pounce upon the child mm-hmm. saying that what teacher you should become an astronaut you should become an engineer a doctor or blah 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 whatever uh, you are told you start believing in that pattern which is given to you by the society and uh, slowly slowly that becomes your expectation from yourself whereas you have come uh, with a different uh, idea of life and that's what you are when you are a child so i what i tell them is you know uh, first thing about this identification is find out what you were as a child you know your own aspiration or what you wanted to become as a child so go back to the memories of say five year old or six year old uh, when you were a lo- small little child uh, when you had probably not uh, you were not so affected by the conditioning uh, of the people around you including your parents mm-hmm. and that is where and uh, that gives you a kind of sense of feeling you have you may not remember exactly what you wanted to become but that there's a sense of feeling that you wanted to do something in life if you connect to that if you go to that depth and you know just find out or remember or connect to that feeling somewhere there you might find that you know this is what you really are or this is what you really want to become mm-hmm. and then that identification with that their own self slowly Uh, helps in disidentification with the facade so then the process of disidentification uh, begins okay so how easy is it for somebody to make this transition after he or she has come to recognize that his or her basic aspiration or desire was something else and not what uh, they are doing currently and once they kind of have zeroed in upon that basic uh, idea about themselves how difficult or easy it is to make that transition because i think that's very challenging you kind of collected so many things around you and then all of a sudden 
you are kind of asked to dismantle all of this to move in the direction of your innate uh, belief or say desire. Right. I, I remember one story, which I always tell in my workshops, mm -hmm. uh, that there was a farmer uh, who found a, you know, an eagle's nest in the farm. And this nest had an eagle's egg, which was still warm. Mm -hmm. So the farmer brought the eagle's egg to his own, his farm and his, you know, kept it along with the eggs of the hens. You know, they, he had a poultry, small poultry bed, bed uh, eggs, other, uh, you know, eggs of the hens. So he put this egg and uh, along with the other eggs, because it, this was warm, after some time, all the eggs hatched. So eagle's egg, egg also hatched and there was mm -hmm. a small little eagle, baby eagle there. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this eagle would see every all the hen, you know, the, the small chickens, they're doing the same things, pecking uh, the grain around themselves and doing, you know, everything inside that uh, little, uh, you know, poultry. So it started doing the same thing, pecked about the farmyard, scrabbling uh, for grain and stuff like that. And it's, uh, this eagle spent its entire lifetime doing the same thing. You know, inside that uh, small little yard. Now, uh, it became very old. So once, you know, when, when it had become very old, it, uh, you know, he had never looked up. He, you know, as a hen, it would always look down because that's what all everybody else did there. So uh, one day it lifted its head up to see the sky. And what it saw was a wonderful sight. There was a beautiful sky up there. And there was a, an eagle which was soaring high up in the sky. So when this eagle, uh, you know, e this old eagle saw this, uh, you know, it sighed and said to itself, if only I had born an eagle. Now, this is what conditioning does to us, you know, because we uh, fit or try to fit ourselves in the box given to us by the society, the pattern the you know uh, kind of a, a structure which is given to us by the society we try to fit in uh, in that box now uh, you may not really relate to that box because you may be a completely different person or you may have a different aspirations different ambitions or different uh, you know goals in life or purpose of life but because you try to fit in you completely forget uh, who you are so that is where we, it begins uh, uh, never realizing you know that Every person is different. Every person can have a different aspiration and uh, fitting in the, that box or fitting to whatever has been given to us is not the answer, but, you know, identifying yourself is. It is difficult uh, sometimes, uh, you know, getting away from that identification of yourself, but uh, it takes time, but I think it's possible. You can do it. So can you cite an example from your own life about having made this journey where you you know started off as something and then you kind of blossomed into somebody else totally which was not too similar to what you had started out as or quite different i can give my example uh, mm -hmm. you know i when i was in eighth or ninth standard we used to choose subjects uh, in our school and uh, i was very good in painting arts i was a very good singer i wanted to do something else in life but uh, at that point, you know, when I said I will take arts, uh, you know, obviously uh, everybody around, including my parents, they said, no, no, you should, you know, uh, you, should an you, know you should become an engineer. You, you should become. So uh, I was, I took mathematics, which all my friends took mathematics. So I also took mathematics. Academically, I was horrible. I knew that I, I was not good in math, but still, you know, mathematics was uh, what I had to study. And uh, then slowly, you know, when we went to the, uh, when we cleared the higher secondary board, there was an engineering uh, entrance test, PET, pre-engineering test. Uh, all my friends appeared in the PET. So, you know, there was no option for me also. You know, I attended that uh, yeah. pre-engineering test. Unfortunately, I got selected. So, you know, once you get selected in pre-engineering test, you have to come out as an engineer from an engineering college. Not, you know, you can't go the other way around. So I became an engineer by default. Right? Mm -hmm. Not by choice. And mm -hmm. then, of course, as you fall into that pattern of life, I, after engineering, I uh, took a job because my father had retired, you know, in the first year, when I was in first year, mm -hmm. 
and then i took up a job came to bombay and spent 17 years doing something which i never wanted to do you know in the corporate world uh, i was of course i started my journey as a, uh, as a steel plant uh, engineer uh, and then went into to, into a multinational company in 17 years i realized i am probably not doing justice to what i wanted to do in life somewhere in between of course i found uh, many many things about myself through uh, various uh, processes which i did but i at one point of time i i you know I decided not to go ahead with the what i was doing but do something what i were really wanted to do and left my job uh, in 2007 and that's what i am doing now so mm. it was a transition you know mm. it happened with time not everybody probably wants to take that step or it's not so easy to kind of take a jump uh, for everyone but at least thinking about what you want to do uh, will create some some kind of transformation or make a difference in your life what you are doing yeah often times you need to make some very fundamental changes in your life which can upset a lot of things maybe even affect relationships your financial stability so many things uh, come into the picture because of which people find it very difficult to take that next step in the journey of life so what do you have to say to people like these who want to make this transition but are fearful about many things related to it you know we have so many fears uh, in our life uh, mm. fear of failure so what you know what what happens if i fail if i mm. you know do the transition fear of being ridiculed or mm. uh, fear of uh you know shamed or criticized for whatever mm. we are doing uh fear of losing position wealth mm. uh, respect mm. uh, of mm. people around mm. uh, even people going away you know because mm. you are mm. doing that change people yeah. going away uh fear mm. of being in discomfort because you mm. don't know wh- whether you'll be living such a comfortable life if you mm. make the transition or not so we mm. we go through uh, you know so many different fears fear of uh, being left alone uh, you know if you are not in the uh, in the same uh, situation which you were earlier you might, might be left alone uh, mm. by the family or by uh, your friends fear of future insecurities about future something going wrong uh, all these things all these fears they uh, are basically that only fears mm. right so when i when i ask somebody to uh, think about themselves and they tell me that you know i am really scared to take to make this transition i tell them whatever you have all these things in mind they at this point of time everything whatever you think about future is just an imagination because it has not happened yet mm. right so fear is nothing but your imagination uh, getting activated inside your mind it has mm. not happened yet mm. right so if you believe so that, that's where our belief system start coming because we have to believe that we uh, are bigger than our failures bigger than our fears what we are you know whatever uh, you know we are scared about our emotions our uh, failures or whatever uh, it is it is all created by us so all everything in our life is smaller than who we are so we are bigger than that mm. right so once we understand this uh, bigger than even our, even our emotions so if there is an emotion of evil of course we are the one uh who has complete control who are the masters of our destiny we control our emotions we control our uh, uh you know our, our belief systems so uh, it takes a while to understand but yes once that sets in uh you can definitely make a positive transition in your life what is the best way to overcome fear because right now what we've discussed is everything related to fear and this fear which is stopping us and it is not easy to get over fear because often times they can feel very very real very tangible how uh, should people overcome their fear to be able to live their full potential so uh, i'll tell you a story here so there was there were two friends uh, ram and sham mm-hmm. they are uh, they were traveling together uh, in the forest so they were going through the forest and it was late in the night so they decided to rest in the forest for the night uh it was a dangerous forest so ram suggested that uh, let me do one thing let me keep a watch i will keep a watch until midnight why uh, you know ram suggested you know you you keep a watch uh, until midnight while i sleep and then after midnight i will keep a watch and you you can go to sleep so both agreed and ram uh, went to uh, you know went to sleep now sham was you know uh, moving around and you know guarding the place few hours passed uh when you know when ram was sleeping sham heard a growl so there was a growl somewhere at a distance so it was a terrifying sound so mm-hmm. sham went there he walked uh, towards the sound and what he sees 
was that there is a gigantic monster approaching uh, him so he got you know scared the monster growled again so mm-hmm. sham was very afraid and he trembled started trembling in fear as soon as that happened uh, the monster grew in size so every time sham trembled monster was was growing twice uh, in size doubling its size so slowly 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 as the monster approached sham it was very very big so you know monster was standing very near to sham and it growled once again terrified by the sound and you know it was a terrible smell and uh, it, sham screamed and collapsed on the ground so he actually became unconscious now ram heard the scream and he thought that sham has you know is now going to sleep and it's my turn to uh, uh, you know guard so he woke ram woke up and said okay now, now I, i think you know it's my turn he saw sham sleeping there uh, because sham was lying down so uh, he thought that now let me you know take my turn to guard the place he sl- started going to and fro so uh, slowly he saw that there is a monster standing there so ram also saw that monster and uh, monster growled at ram so ram asked him uh, who are you why are you here every time monster growled ram would ask a question what are you doing here what is your uh, you know what do you want and every time ram asked a question the monster was shrinking in its size so every time there was a question there was a logical question asked by ram monster became half its size what are you doing here what you know uh, uh, what do you want from me and stuff like that so uh, in some time the monster became very very small maybe just 2 inches tall so ram just took the monster and put it in its own pocket the morning came and the, you know when sham woke up in the morning he asked ram you know did you see a monster there was a huge monster there and it was a like a terrible monster and i don't know how we survived because the last thing i remember is that i fainted so ram took out the little monster from its pocket and said was it this monster so sham said yes this is the monster but how did it become so small so ram said every time i asked this monster a question it was shrinking uh, in its size so every time uh, you know i was asking the monster a logical question what are you doing here it came, became smaller 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 now related to our life the fears in our life as well right uh, every time we are afraid our fears are growing bigger our mm-hmm. fears are you know becoming larger and larger and larger because fears are, fear is feeding on our emotions okay so it has become larger and larger and larger but every time we question them every time you question a fear why it is happening what, what its role in our life you will find the fear becoming less and less effective and it, there will be a time when you know the fear will be least effective in your life it will not matter so the idea is question your fear make a logical conversation with the fear and you will find that uh, its effectiveness will completely go away in, in our life so what is the role of spirituality in overcoming one's fear is the, can we take recourse to spiritual practices to overcome these uh, debilitating fears that we have yes uh, absolutely because uh, uh, you know spirituality brings in faith hmm. right uh, when we talk about faith we have faith in our own abilities and faith in the universe whatever we call the, you know a universe or higher force or whatever it is which is uh, you know guiding protecting us all the time so uh, once we have the fear on our own abilities uh, that gives us uh, you know the confidence the hope and you know uh, uh, if we have fear in the uh, in, in the you know universe whatever you call it uh, you will also uh, you know get the strength so i'll tell you a story about hope what happens when we have uh, when we create hope because uh, you know if you have your own faith in your own abilities and the universe something uh, magical happens inside us so there was an experiment which was done on a small mouse this mouse was uh, kept in a jar of water and this mouse was you know it it could swim for 5 to 10 minutes or 15 minutes and in 15 minutes it would start drowning so uh, what was done was every time it started drowning it was taken out uh, you know dried and kept aside for a while so that it can rest again it was put in the water 
after a few times of doing the same thing, the one, uh, you know, it happened that mouse was put in the jar and allowed to swim for, you know, as long as, as it could. How much time it would, you know, uh, swim after that? Because the, the, mouth ha the, the mouse had uh, developed this hope that it will be saved every time it is going to drown. It swam for 60 hours just on that hope, right? Not 10, 15 minutes, one hour, two hours, 60 hours. That is how uh, hope is magical. It creates miracles inside our mind, right? So faith and hope, these are the two things which, has, which are brought by spirituality. And when we, when we say faith, it has to be an unconditional faith. You know, we have a lot of conditions which we put on our faith. Uh, conditions such as, you know, we we have a lot of logics, you know, as a sodiota, this is not this is not going to happen. How can, you know, an external energy or the universe mm -hmm. help us? There is always something which is always, you know, which is guiding us opportunity. I'll tell you a story. How unconditional, uh, uh, you know, faith should be, or rather how we don't believe in our, uh, you know, inner voice or... Uh, the guidance from the universe there was a mountaineer who was traveling up the mountain and he wanted to reach the peak so uh, he uh, was kind of you know uh, he continuously kept on climbing the mountain uh, throughout the day and the night approached so when the night approached it was completely dark pitch dark no you know he, the, the mountain, mountaineer could not see anything around it was like pitch uh, complete dark and he was still climbing up because he was you know uh, close to the peak now so he wanted to catch the peak uh, in a shortest possible time now along with the darkness it was very very cold as well so it was it would be like minus 35 degrees centigrade very cold extremely cold where a person would die this uh, you know uh, uh, chill in the you know that chill which can actually uh, go through your bones hmm. so uh, while climbing uh, because he, the mountaineer could not see anything, it slipped. He slipped somewhere. And then he started rolling down the mountain. Okay. It was pitch dark and this, he was rolling down the mountain. A point came, there was a cliff. So at the cliff, he could actually hold a root of a tree. He could not see anything, but he held on to that root of the tree. And, uh, you know, he was dangling by that on the, uh, at the edge of the cliff. He tried calling people, you know, help me. Nobody was there. There was no sound. Uh, nobody could come there to, you know, help him. He was, crying, you know, shouting at the top of his voice. There was no response. And night was completely dark. He was shivering because it was so cold and he knew that he was going to die. So uh, he started calling God. He said, God, I have been, you know, I have showed so much faith in you. Please come and help me. I am going to die. So he thought that there is a voice coming from the top. And the voice said, son, I'm there to help you. Let go of whatever you're holding on. So mountaineer thought that, you know, uh, in this cold conditions, mostly you get this hypothermia. Hypothermia basically means in cold conditions, your brain starts acting uh, in, mm -hmm. a, in a crazy way. So he thought he, he's getting hypothermia. So he said, this can't happen. He, you know, started questioning, how, you know, oh God, how can you say this? I am, you know, uh, holding on to one thing and you are asking me to let it go. So again, there was his voice, son, I'm there to help you. Let go of whatever you are holding on. He said, I have definitely gone crazy. I'm not going to let go of whatever I'm holding. So the scene changed, cut, cut to uh, the next morning. There's a small village, a little hamlet. And the people uh, are starting to come out. It, it had been extremely cold during the night. So the people started coming out of the uh, hamlet. And what they see was that just ahead, uh, you know, just next to the, uh, the, the village, there's a small cliff and there's a body hanging there mm -hmm. by the root of a tree, few feet above ground. And everybody then gathers around that body and say, oh, you know, if he had just, you know, just left this... Uh, uh, root of the tree and come to our houses we could have given him shelter our faith is like that our faith is very conditional we would believe or we would have faith only when that suits our logical mind if it doesn't we would not have faith the faith should be you know conditional that is what spirituality does to us it gives us unconditional faith uh, in the universe mm -hmm. 
Okay, so there are many questions uh, which I want to ask you, but the right, the one which is coming to my mind is related to your personal life. So can you give us an example about how faith worked miracle in your own life and made you make that transition from being in your mind and then trusting in the universe unconditionally? It happened when I uh, took this uh, step of leaving my job and coming to this path. So after 17 years of working, I was when I was the country head of a uh, multinational company. Uh, you know, this any logical thinking person would think this was a you know madness. This was mm -hmm. like you know, how could anyone do that? I was mm -hmm. uh, earning a good salary, and uh, suddenly next month there is no salary, right? So when I left my job, so. Uh, you know, I, I had already taken the step, but I already, uh, I mean, I by that time I had got my answers. And I also had this belief that whatever happens, I will be, I will always be uh, protected. There is all, there's a law which is called as, uh, you know, whatever you need in any, uh, at any point of time in your life, you are provided. Law of provid providence, right? So law of providence of universe always works in your life. So I have seen this uh, because even after I left my job, I had believed, strong belief that I'll be looked after and you know, nothing wrong, nothing will mm -hmm. wrong will happen in my life and things will, uh, you know, happen as smoothly as they were happening before uh, mm -hmm. I left my job. And this actually happened in mm -hmm. my worst uh, financial times. I could uh, pay the loan of my house uh, where I'm currently staying. Uh, in such situation, I was driving the best of the cars. In such situations, I was I be uh, actually went on a uh, holiday abroad because somebody sent us tickets. One of our friends uh, when, were in Japan and they could not invite their family that year to Japan, so they uh, invited us to Japan. So uh, I've seen that despite uh, you know uh, I mean not having a secure job, things were working in such a way that uh, you know something was actually. Uh, keeping us afloat, you know, mm -hmm. lifting us. And uh, I never felt that uh, I made a mistake by leaving my job because it was as if something is looking after us and not only looking after us, but looking after us so well mm -hmm. that uh, you can't, you know, really miss. These are all miracles of life. And I think uh, we all go through miracles in, uh, you know, on a, in a day-to-day -day basis. We miss out on those miracles. Mm -hmm. But it works so beautifully, this law of providence. Mm -hmm. That it's amazing to when, when you actually uh, experience it on your own. Okay. So what was that turning point, Santoshi, where you decided that you need to listen to the call of your soul? And was it was there some kind of a spiritual intervention in your life which happened, which made you take, take this leap of faith? Because this is what I want to know, and I am sure all my listeners also want to know this, that how this divine in intervention happened? Because it does seem that it had happened where somewhere you were led to understand that your call is different from what you're doing and you need not fear and go ahead in that path. What happened was, uh, uh, of course, you know, I was uh, keen to know many, uh, many things about afterlife when, you know, even before my marriage. But I think, uh, you know, after uh, I got married, uh, we both, me and my wife, uh, both had a common interest that we wanted to know more about what happens after death. So we started studying about it. We started, you know, doing a lot of things, experiencing and stuff like that. So uh, we were already, you know, after my marriage, things uh, turned in such a way that we slowly turned towards, uh, you know, knowing the truths about life and afterlife and stuff. Uh, during this process, two things happened. One, uh, in 2003, uh, one of our very good close friends, they uh, took us to a place which is about one and a half kilometers from, from Mumbai. Mm -hmm. It's a place called Ganeshpuri, if you have heard about it. And uh, there is this Samadhi of Swami Nityanand. Uh, he took Samadhi in 1962, so I have never physically met him. But uh, something happened when I went there. And it was a divine kind of a feeling, divine uh, experience when I was there uh, for the first time in 2003. And then, of course, we went there several times uh, in that year and uh, it was a kind of a series of miracles that started happening that time you know I, I think of something and it would happen I you know think of something I would say uh, I want this and this would happen so a series of miracles uh, actually got me to believe that something is there which is mm -hmm. now changed which is you know kind of uh, something is help helping me in my 
life. I didn't know what, but uh, it started helping me. And uh, I think that point onwards, uh, you know, I, I always feel that there is a presence and I believe that it's uh, Swami Nityanand, which is always guiding uh, me in this uh, whole process uh, in, you know, during whole transition period. But that was the, uh, the first thing. The second thing that happened was uh, me and my wife both are relation therapists. So, you mm-hmm. know, we were meditating uh, at one place uh, on one day at the same time. Uh, we didn't have kids for a long time. You know, uh, even now, of course, we don't have kids. So uh, this was in 2004 or something when, uh, uh, you know, my wife had this question, uh, why we don't have kids after seven, eight years of marriage. So obviously, the, you know, there were questions uh, by the family, by the society, why you don't have kids and stuff like that. Medically, everything was okay, but we didn't have kids. So uh, my wife had this question, uh, why we don't have kids? And I had the question, uh, what is the purpose of my life? So we were meditating in two different rooms at the same time. And both of us had a metaphysical experience. Metaphysical experience is a real-time spiritual experience. So we get our real-time answers. So I saw uh, my guru, Nitin Swami, uh, coming to me. I hugged him. And I had this question. I, I asked him, why? what is the purpose of my life? So he said, your purpose in li- this life is to heal the world. I could clearly see, you know, see him saying this to me, uh, to heal the world. And he said, that's why you have come together in this lifetime, you and your wife. And that is the reason why you don't have kids, because that would have taken a lot of your resources, energy and time, uh, which you would, uh, not, you know, you would spend in following your purpose of life. At the same time, my wife was uh, having a similar experience. She saw all the masters merging into one, into a big ball of light. And there was a voice coming from this ball of light saying that you don't have kids because your purpose of life is to heal the world. And that is why you both have come together in this lifetime. So, you know, after the meditation, we exchanged notes. So we were surprised to know that at the same time, we got the same message. And that made our faith even stronger, that there is something uh you know which is which wants me and both of us in fact to change the course of life whatever i was doing is not what i am uh, here to do so slowly slowly that change happened and uh, by when in 2007 when i left my job you know uh, after having this uh, experience and knowing my purpose of life my uh, wife was still she's an architect so she was still doing her projects so she said uh, you go ahead with whatever you want to do i will support financially uh, till the time you settle and then I will come in on the same field as well. So after some time now, of course, she has also changed her course of life. She is an author uh, herself uh, and uh, author and speaker. So we both have now changed course of our, what we, you know, we are doing what we have never learned in schools and colleges mm-hmm. and doing something which we were, we wanted to do in life. Oh, great. That's a, that was one amazing journey of life. Uh, you uh, say that uh, your guru told you that the purpose of your life was to heal the, heal world. the world. A lot of uh, these ailments regarding the world, they come from unhealed emotions, uh, which we are seeing currently, that most of us have some kind of unresolved emotional issue which we are carrying within ourselves, which often turns out to be the root of the problem which is affecting us. So. Um, Santosh, please tell us how should we handle these strong emotions because mostly society frowns upon the expression of anything which is negative in nature, for example, anger or resentment or shame or, or unforgiveness. These are things which fester inside us, but we are unable to really handle them because we, we don't know how, how to ex- express them in such a way so that we get the kind of release we want. And yet we do not upset the apple cart of relationships. So what do you have to say about this? So basically, uh, if you look at it closely, uh, it kind of forms a vicious circle uh, or Mm -hmm. a spiral, you would say. Uh, Everything starts with fear. Because, you know, we have fear of either losing someone or fear of something going wrong or whatever it is. Fear leads us to stress and anxiety. And... uh, This stress and anxiety leads us to the feeling of being a victim, the victimhood, okay? Victim, being a victim, uh, when we think that we are a victim, leads us to anger. Anger leads us to doing something which we later regret, guilt, panic. We strike a panic button. And once we strike the panic button, again, it goes to fear. 
right? So it's a like it's like a circle, and this circle is actually not going like this, but it is going like this, like a spiral, and it is pulling you down. What it is leading you, uh, you know, this uh, whole spiral of emotions is uh, towards losing your natural state of immunity or natural state uh, where you know uh, uh, you would your body would uh, go through this whole process of uh, you know healing itself you know mm. uh, uh, self healing process so uh, this whole spiral of emotion would be obstructing uh, uh, this self healing and when our immunity reduces obviously all the diseases uh, you know which are which are there uh, around us and we are protecting ourselves with that immunity uh, attacks us suddenly so you'll find that if we are uh, emotionally down if we are uh, you know uh, fearful or uh, affected by this whole spiral of negative emotions pulling us down uh, most often than not you will find that all this, all these uh, diseases uh, would you know uh, start affecting you more and more mm-hmm. so th- that becomes a root cause so but uh, then uh, is it like for example i am festering with anger okay I-, i want to really let it out on somebody i am angry with yet i know that the person does not have the receptivity receptivity to understand my anger how should i handle it so that it does not burn me but at, at the same time my message also gets across to the one i am angry with you know there was somebody who was asking the same question and i asked uh, uh, this person to go to the top of the uh, you know building and shout whatever you you know she wanted to shout and stuff so you know she could vent out the anger but there is a, a very beautiful way of uh, you know uh, or there's a you know a kind of a light in on a lighter uh, vein you can uh, create a situation where the anger is converted into something else mm-hmm. so uh, there was one lady who uh, said i am so angry uh, on my mother in law that uh, you know i cannot stand her whenever she comes i get uh, very very angry and i i know she doesn't understand me and I, if i want to express myself uh, uh, you know she would not definitely not understand so uh, i don't know how to deal with this because uh, there is a huge amount of different difference between our understanding and i can't stand her so mm. you know there was an anger uh, for mm. whatever there's a method which is called a superimposing so if you have a situation where there when some uh, a person comes in front of you whom you can't stand imagine in your own mind that person in a very funny situation right for example i ask this lady that imagine your mother in law in a bikini so you know in a funny situation and she said i can't stop laughing if i think anything like that see this person or imagine this person in a very funny situation and that fun or that laughter inside you will completely take away anger and make the situation very light in uh, you know in your mind and then you can start thinking in a different way your whole state of mind changes so superimpose a funny situation or a situation which is a lighter on top of this anger and you'll find mm-hmm. the, your state of mind changes as well okay the current times are uh, particularly very difficult for the world at large uh, there are financial dif- difficulties there is insecurity related to the future relationships are very difficult to keep together so what you ad- what is your advice to people in the current times how should they lead their life and what are the lessons which they should learn from the current scenario uh, there are few things which i tell people first thing uh, is change your perspective about yourself you are mm. not what you think you are mm. you are something much bigger than uh, who you think you are so mm. one has to change your perspective about yourself because you have your own you come with your own dreams your own goals and because of this facade which i was talking about in the uh, beginning you have you know you have gone away from that to self of yourself mm. so you have to change your uh, perspective about yourself and uh, connect you know uh, yourself to that Uh, in a self that uh, true self whatever uh, you know w- whatever you were when you were a small uh, kid that is the first thing uh, make a list of things which you really want to do in life i call them bucket list but you can call it list of dreams whatever you want to do in life make a list of things 
and start working on that that will change your focus from mm-hmm. uh, things which are which are not happening in your life to the things which you could do so you know the focus would change to new possibilities mm-hmm. right so start working on first make a list create a list of things you want to do in life and then start working on them you know your resources you know the time you have you know everything you know how you can reach uh, those goals so that will change your focus from negative uh, to possibilities you know positive or possibilities you also have to watch your inner dialogue what you tell yourself uh, you know uh, inner dialogue i'll tell you one story uh, there was one lady margaret who uh, was working in a uh, you know had a very average job and mm-hmm. working in a very average atmosphere in a big company so nobody actually knew her so she used to go to office nobody noticed her uh, in the office she would go and come back uh, she used to stay with her mother in a very small apartment now once uh, she was going to the office and uh, she found that there is a new shop which has opened across just across the door across her house so this was a shop of hats so she said let me go and try a few hats there so she went inside she saw a few customers there there was a small little girl who was there as well so uh, she started tying uh, different hats <clears throat> and uh, there was one hat which she really liked when she wore that hat Uh, she was really looking good she thought and then the little girl who was there in the shop also said that ma'am you are looking so wonderful in this hat as well you know she said, told her mom mom look this lady is so looking so beautiful so she was convinced that she needs to buy that hat so she went to the uh, counter and paid for that hat and then came out when she came out she felt as if she is you know walking on clouds because she was so happy and so confident and so glowing that she felt as if the life has become suddenly become so beautiful around she goes to the office the doorman who never used to notice stood up and said you know good morning ma'am uh, you know doorman asked her which floor button should i press in the lift so she was very happy she said i don't know what has happened but uh, i am feeling very happy and confident she went to the office all, all the people in the office they started coming to her and saying wow you are looking so beautiful today so you know nice and so pretty everybody noticed her including her boss her boss said we have not been able to we have not talked about your salary raise for a while let's go for a lunch today and talk about your salary raise so it was like a wonderful day for her in the evening she went back uh, taking a taxi went home rang the bell mom opened the door and mom was like amazed she said wow uh, margaret what what has happened to you you are looking so gorgeous today so she said yeah yeah mom i know i am looking very good because it's all because of this hat which i bought so the mom said what hat which hat are you talking about so margaret touched her head and there was no hat so then she panicked she said i don't know where i left that hat and she went through the all the uh, incidences of that day and realized when she paid for the hat she never took the hat from the uh, shop right so what had actually happened is that margaret thought she is looking good by because she is wearing the hat and that thought and that belief itself made her day so beautiful so wonderful so this is what inner dialogue does to us what you tell yourself is very very important than what actually happens to you right so keep mm-hmm. your inner dialogue mm-hmm. uh, you know uh, in a positive way keep your, telling yourself that you are gorgeous you are the best you can do everything and that will help you to you know take uh, take on any challenges uh, in your life mm-hmm. next thing is we have to go beyond your fears because fears you are bigger than your fears right so you have to think that your fears and emotions you have to go beyond them and our values you know we have a value system so we we know that the virtues like honesty and truthfulness uh, love compassion uh, mm-hmm. kindness courage forgiveness these are the value systems we have uh, you know been brought up with these mm-hmm. values become our anchors in the time when our the you know ship of our life uh, goes up and down mm-hmm. uh, you know whenever there is a storm uh, you know we would see the, the surface would you know experience the ups and downs of mm-hmm. the tide the waves but if we have the anchor in these values of life uh, we would know never Uh, go as free we would still be firmly uh, you know uh, positioned at one place so make values 
your uh, anchor and you will find that uh, you not only uh, are steady in the time in the storms of your life but also uh, growing and glowing uh, mm -hmm. in all senses that's so true okay um that brings me to another question uh, santosh you are also a past life regression therapist uh, can you share a memorable incident from your life as a healer and a life coach including as a past life regression therapist something which really blew you oh uh, yeah there are uh, many i mean uh, i i have to think which one i should tell because uh, well i can tell one incident where we had a validation of our uh, you know one of our uh, experiences uh, there was a girl who had uh, you know come for past life regression and uh, she uh, used to kind of have you know she was 30 year old but uh, she remembered that she used to have visions at the age of 2 and a half to 3 year old or 4 year old when she was a small mm -hmm. kid that uh, she is lying in a pool of blood and uh, you know she didn't know why she saw those kind of visions and at a very early age when she was very small she could uh, describe an aeroplane from inside you know she had never seen an aeroplane before but she could describe an aeroplane from inside so of course after some time those visions stopped coming but she always kept, felt incomplete uh, you know in that why these visions used to come and what is this all about so during regression she found herself uh, as a very wealthy uh, lady in london she was a business woman in london and she had a private jet of her of her, uh, of her own private aircraft of her own and she used to travel by this private aircraft from london to other places in europe so she saw all this during that experience uh, once she was coming from france to london flying along with four of uh, four of her male colleagues when she saw that uh, while landing just before landing the plane crashed and when the plane crashed she again had the same vision which she used to see uh, when when she was very young she was lying in a pool of blood and uh, the doctors were saying you know you'll be all right you'll be all right but she went into blank that means she died uh, after that incident but she could remember the name uh, of the aircraft and the uh, uh, you know month and year of the air, you know that aircraft crash so after the regression we said let us you know find out the, all the aircraft crashes are mentioned in google so we tried to google whether this thing had happened she remembered november 1975 as the uh, month and date uh, month and year of the crash so we found that on 15th november 1975 there was a private aircraft crash near london and there was one lady and four male who uh, you know died in that aircraft and uh, the name of the aircraft also matched with what she remembered about that so we could validate that incident uh, you know after when we when we googled about this past life regression so these kind of things happen you know the, you know the validations take place and when then you you know kind of uh, various mesmerizing experiences you get during this process there we have um, a few listeners tonight so uh, anybody would like to ask santosh any question your uh, talk was of course uh, very illuminating and educating and uh, uh, particularly the portion which related to faith so it is uh, commonly understood that faith sorts out all our problems if it is unconditional but the experience that i have undergone both of myself and uh, others around me is that the strong ego which protests our having unconditional faith how do we overcome that ego always says that you can do things but faith is something where we have to say that surrender and then absolutely. say god will do things for us absolutely yeah that's how that's how it happens uh, uh you know uh, how do we reconcile this position uh i think it comes with understanding it comes with uh, you know when we experience uh, things uh, in a much subtler way what happens is that uh, we believe in doing things our you know the way we do things in life we believe in being a doer uh, we just have to shift that position into uh, instead of you know doer we just experience uh, things happening the way it should be you know it's like uh, a river flowing uh, you know to to its course towards the sea now what happens is that when the river is flowing it's flowing on its own if there are obstacles the river would find its own way and it would 
uh, you know, still go towards its ultimate destination. What happens when uh, there is there is a permanent obstacle in uh, in the path of the on the path of the river? If you create a dam, suppose what will happen? The river cannot flow around, so it raises its level. Right, the water goes up, and then when it crosses the dam, it it actually raises its level. So similarly, when we have uh, situations where we think we cannot handle, uh, as you rightly said, you now be like a river because life, when it flows through you, uh, surrender as you rightly uh, said, life when it goes through you, you just observe and things would happen. So uh, universe works in different ways. We just have to believe that it happens. Change your belief systems, and I'm sure it will happen. I'm sure this surrender is one of the toughest lesson to learn or master. It doesn't come easy because it involves uh, cultivating a lot of patience, belief, faith, trust, plenty of uh, <laughs> plenty of things uh, which uh, most of us are very impatient about. We want to get things quickly, and then we have to imbibe all of these qualities to be able to reap the rewards of being in the state of surrender. Anybody else would like to ask any question? So thank you, Santoshi, for your illuminating words. And my question is this. You said mm, two, three times that you are bigger than you think you are, right? Now, if a person thinks they're bigger or understands they're bigger than what they think they are at a given point, they need to have some of my idea, at least, of what that bigger thing is. So how could they know that? What could guide them to say, well, if I'm not, if I'm small now, what is that bigger thing that I really am? Uh, okay, so uh, one thing uh, uh, we have to understand that uh, whatever we, uh, you know, what we have created in our life, uh, whether uh, they are our emotions, belief systems, uh, or you know, our expectations. Uh, all those are creation of our own self. You know, so we create them. We create from our uh, experiences and uh, whatever we have gone through in our life. But uh, these are just offshoots of who we are, right? So uh, bigger. When we say bigger, uh, we. Uh, you know, uh, we just go a little deeper into who we are and we uh, realize that each one of us uh, comes with a, you know, it's called as PPW. PPW is purpose, potential and wisdom. Each one of us, when we are born, we are here with a deeper purpose, which is like a compass for us, uh, guiding us throughout our lifetime. Right? So we have a purpose. Uh, we have we all come with that potential to reach that purpose, so to do whatever we are here for. And we have wisdom, which is basically nothing but a roadmap to reach there. So this PPW, uh, which is there inside us, in fact, it's at the cellular level, each cell of us, uh, is what keeps on guiding us throughout our life. Now, uh, we are definitely bigger than our emotions. Our, for example, our guilt, regrets, angers, uh, we are definitely bigger than our fears and insecurities and also bigger than what we think we are. We think we are is created by people's expectations and opinions about us and what we want to project ourselves in front of people. Right? So all that, you know, uh, if you take all that, of course, we are much bigger than what uh, all this is all about. Uh, Santoshi, uh, I have another question on my mind. You're talking about uh, knowing yourself and reaching your potential and living the purpose of your life. Yet, we have to admit there are many who fail to it, who are unable to recognize why they were born and in which direction they were supposed to lead their life. And at the fag on the end of their lives, they're full of regret. Now, this is one point in time where you, know, you cannot change anything. You have lived most of your life. And when you look back, you, you feel very sorry about certain decisions that you made. So what is your advice to such people who really couldn't uh, realize their dreams or realize their life purpose in life? I believe that it's never late to change uh, your course of life. It's never late because I have had, I've seen many, many examples where uh, even 
you know, uh, one uh, has, you know, uh, you know, you have the, in our society, we have this age called retirement age, right? Mm-hmm. So we physically we feel that we have, you know, retired from normal uh, activities and stuff like that. But uh, even after that, if you realize at any point of time, it doesn't matter what point of time, if you realize uh, that uh, you want to change the course of your action, it's never late. So uh, wherever you are in whatever point of life you are in, uh, please make the effort to change your course of life. And that will be uh, a good enough reason for you to have no regret when you are on your deathbed. I think, yes, uh, Santoshi, that was a very, very engaging uh, talk that you gave today. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming to the Life Post show and enlightening us with the wisdom that you have harvested through all your life experiences, efforts, learnings. Thank you so much for giving us very, very useful tips about managing our life, our dreams, our goals, and how to not succumb to fear. Thank you so much. Once again, Santoshi, thank you for being on the life. Thank you, Shivi. Thank you so much for giving this opportunity. I uh, am really thankful for all the people who attended and all the people who are going to see this. Uh, it's wonderful talking to you always, uh, Shivi, and uh, all the best to all of you. Mm-hmm.